Welcome to Thursday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football giants. So glad you could join us today. For the next hour, we will be here at 201-939-4513. 201-939-4513. Jot down the number. Give us a call. I know you folks probably still have some roster questions and draft stuff left over. So many people were trying to get in the first few days. We're going to try to make this a caller-centric show today, if at all possible. We did a lot of talk yesterday about the NFC East. So we're going to try to see what you guys have to say about maybe the division or the conference or just the Giants. And that's so perfectly okay, too. Um, Matt Sitek is with me. I'm Paul Tatino. And, again, you could always go to hashtag Giants Chat on Twitter as well. If you're a little bashful, we'll try to get to some of those as well. Uh, if you miss the show live, you can always find an archive on our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, and at Giants.com slash podcast. It's funny, Matt and I were talking yesterday, and I don't know how many folks may have tuned into that program, about maybe the thin spots or the questionable spots, the cloudy spots on the Giants' depth chart. Um, I had identified uh, maybe tackle on the depth chart, uh, defensive tackle, and possibly corner. Did you agree with those three? Yeah, I did. Okay. Yep. Well, guess what, <laughs> folks? After our show yesterday, the Giants brought in a veteran corner. They did not, not that we were cheating because we were not. <laughs> no. that this happened after we were done with the program. Uh, and, uh, hey, you know what? The more the merrier. Uh, why don't you tell the folks about it? Yeah, so the Giants signed veteran defensive back David Long Jr. Not to be confused by the Tennessee Titans linebacker David Long Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, might be a little bit more of a household name, but... Uh, the David Long Jr. that the Giants signed is, has been around for, I believe, it's five years now, entering his sixth season in the NFL. Right. Spent his first four years with the Rams, was part of that Super Bowl winning team. Uh, and then last year, he jumped around between three different teams. He was with the Raiders, uh, the Panthers, and he finished the season, I believe, with the Packers. Mm -hmm. uh, so David Long Jr. is an uh, outside cornerback. Uh add some depth to the position. I mean, I know I mentioned yesterday that I thought the number one priority in terms of filling the roster out with any potential veterans would be the cornerback position. And we touched on a couple of names. The names we brought up, though, were definitely more towards the top of the market of cornerbacks that are still left. Uh, I believe – so I, what I think that this move sort of indicates is that, at least as of now, the front office and the coaching staff seem to be you know, pretty – content with going into the season at the top of the cornerback depth chart with how it currently is. I think that means guys like Nick McLeod, Cordell Flott are going to get a serious opportunity to win that starting corner spot opposite Deontay Banks on the outside. Then, of course, we still need to figure out what's going on with Aaron Robinson. Yes, You know, of coming off a year of injury rehab. Just don't know exactly where he stands. Think about Long that I found interesting, and quite frankly, folks, you know, I don't remember watching him play in any of his previous stops in the NFL. Uh, he goes 5'11", but how about this? 227 pounds for a corner? Oh, no. That's, oh, did that's I the pick, linebacker. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. I, picked up the, I, I picked up the wrong one. <laughs> I picked up the wrong one. You got to be careful. They're both David Long Jr. So I, when it's, I, it's... Yeah, I, I, here I am looking at this. This is the guy <laughs> from Michigan, former Michigan player. Yes. Yes, 5'11". Um, 160, 187, 5 of 11, 187, former third round pick of the Rams in 2019. Um, yeah, I got, I got tricked right away. Right, right, <laughs> off, right out of the get go. I got tricked. I picked the, I picked the wrong David Long on my, on my roster sheet. Yeah. NFL.com has him listed now as 196 pounds up to 196. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, at 5 11, you know, that is not unquestionable that potentially, you know, if necessary, he could try some slot stuff and maybe he could compete. You know, at 5'11", that's kind of an interchangeable for inside-outside. Yeah. You know, guys like 5'9", oh, he's a slot guy. <laughs> he does have experience playing in the slot. Yeah. He's played more on the outside corner position, but, you know, PFF has him down as 947 snaps on the outside and 157 in the slot. So he does have some experience there. Now, the interesting part for me, and when we look at this roster opposite Tay Banks, and we're going to get to your calls in just a couple of minutes, I promise you folks, but I do want to vet this out just a little bit because 
As it stands now, we know Banks is the right cornerback. And we know at the moment they're saying that uh, they're going to give the rookie a shot to win a slot. Yes, Joe Shane said that. Okay. So it seems to me right now, based on just experience and, and being here, is that Cordell Flott has at least a nose ahead of everybody else on the other side. It seems to me. Well, I would say Flott or McLeod. Or McLeod. Yes. Possibly. I think, Possibly. Yeah. I think this move, because they didn't go out and, you know, attempt to sign someone like Stephen Gilmore, Stephen Nelson, mm. even uh, Witherspoon that we talked about yesterday. Right. The fact that they got someone, I guess, a little bit lower down, I would say, on the, you know, free agent totem pole, I think it's because they have confidence in the guys that are already in the building. And I saw a stat Jordan Renan tweeted this morning in regards to the the move that we the Giants made yesterday is that last season Nick McLeod allowed 5.7 yards per target on, play. on plays where he was the nearest defender. Granted, this wasn't limited playing time, but that 5.7 yards per target was the best of any defensive back on the team, including Deontay Banks. So, you know, they brought the, – the coaching staff brought – and the front office brought Nick McLeod back. I think it's because they want to give him an, a legitimate chance to win that starting outside corner spot opposite Deontay Banks. Yeah, I, I don't know if they do or they don't. What I do know is that he's been here for a couple of years. He's been an outstanding special teams player. And then every time they're forced to put him into the lineup, he does well. Yeah. But they, they've they never shown an inclination to want to put him in there. It's always like he's in there out of necessity, which is why I have a hard time believing that they're really going to give him a chance to win the job. But maybe with the new D.C., maybe he is going to be given that chance. I just don't know the answer to that. But I like Nick McLeod. He and I have been talking ever since he got here. And it's like when he came out of Notre Dame, he was a good player. I still don't know why he wasn't more highly thought of when he came out of uh, out of uh, the Irish program. I still don't get that. Yeah, me neither. I mean, I guess he we, was productive. We see it I guess, every year with you know each draft class. They're guys that you know we think on paper should go way earlier than they actually end up going, and sometimes those guys you know end up proving all the the doubters wrong once they get to the NFL. And I think McLeod has done that in the limited opportunities he's had, as you mentioned. I mean, I know, you know, we've talked about how you can't always just look at PFF grades and, you know, I don't want to get you started. Why, on why, why do you why do you go there? Because, no, you look, just do, you just those, do that to those stats, they, <laughs> I know they're not, they're not like the end all be all, but I think if, sometimes they could be at least a slightly good indication I of need, a player. I need to introduce you to J.J. Watt. <laughs> You and him need to get into a room together. You look, would change your mind real quick. Look, I, I do not think that PFF stats, you know, are the end all be all. But I do think that sometimes they can give you at least, you know, somewhat of a, a in-depth look at a player's abilities and what he's done on the field. But regardless, I only bring this up to say that last year on a 182 coverage snaps, Nick McLeod earned an 80.7 coverage grade, which is very good. <clears throat> He earned a very good mark. And even David Long Jr., again, in only 100 coverage snaps, earned a 75.6 coverage grade, which is a very solid grade as well. So, I, you know, this move yesterday makes me think that with between Long, McLeod, Flott, you know, even some of the younger guys. You know, Trey you, Hawkins. Trey Hawkins. You know, you brought up Aaron Robinson if, if he's healthy. And Caleb get, Hayes get on the is field. here, too. And, and, you know, he's another veteran who's who's been signed to this roster. But we don't ever talk about him, but he's here. Yeah, I think they have a good group of, you know, pretty much all relatively young guys. I mean, of all the guys we just mentioned, David Long would be the oldest, and he's only been in the league for five years. <laughs> what does that say, right? I think that, wow. you know, I think the that oldest. the coaching staff is going to give them, give this group a chance to compete and see if one of these guys can emerge. And if, you know, if none of these guys really do step up and really take over that second outside corner spot – there still will be veterans available once training camp starts. I mean, we talked about this yesterday. Two years ago, the Giants signed Fabian Moreau after the season already started. We were, I think, two weeks, right. three weeks into the season right. they signed him, and he ended up being the outside corner opposite of Dory Jackson for almost the entire season and yes. played pretty well. So there could be guys that could be found later, you know, once we get closer to training camp or even during training camp. But for right now, I think they're going to let these young guys compete and see if one of them can really step up. It might have been before your time when Leon Hall came in here. 
Uh, Sensabaugh was another one. Cody Sensabaugh mm-hmm. came in here. Uh, you know, the Giants have over the years, they've, they've picked up those guys, those those kind of stopgap guys. Uh, you get them off the street and, and you hope they can they can help you out and they can do something. But, uh, hey, bottom line is somebody from that list of players we talked about is going to have to emerge because in week one, you need to have a corner on the left side. Yes. <laughs> All right, Banks is going to be on the right side. Someone's going to be in the slot. And Darnay Holmes, remember, he resigned. Yeah. And Darnay... Uh, Terrific special teams player. He developed last year into a real whiz. Uh, remains to be seen if he can get back into the competition for, for the slot spot. Uh, well, who knows? Maybe maybe the new D.C. says maybe Darnay Holmes gets to fight for a boundary role. Who knows? Uh, bottom line, Giants need to figure out with this group of players what style that they want from their corner and then who is going to seize the opening day spot doesn't mean he's going to have it for the whole season just nope. means he'll have it for week one yep 201-939-4513 is our phone number our lines are buzzing like a uh, christmas tree so we're going to get to our phone calls in fact uh, let's take one phone call right here and then i'll get to the spots in a moment uh line one has marty from matterhawken your first on B- big blue kickoff live hello hey paul how you doing all right how, how you doing, doing? hey marty pretty good pretty good hey uh Looking at on paper, I'm looking at the NFC East. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it looks like the Giants have closed up the gap. Uh, you know, uh, personnel wise. Be careful. We and, thought that last year too. And how'd yeah, that work yeah, out? You I'm, just never know. But I, I have a funny feeling that uh, you know everybody's going to be pretty much in it to the thick of things towards the end, and I think the deciding factor is going to be towards the end of the season on who does the best job of coaching to to take over the division. That That's what I feel. I'll, I'll take your uh, comment off the year. All right. Thanks, Marty. Well, look, here's what we know. We know that Brian Dable was a coach of the year two years ago. We know Philadelphia has a head coach who has gone to a Super Bowl yep. and did what he did. Uh, we know Dallas has a coach who wins a ton of regular season games, but has a little less success in the postseason. Does have one Super Bowl? He has one. Granted, but, with another team. But yes, and for all the times and, Aaron and for all the times that he's been in the playoffs, his postseason record is is something you can sneeze at. And then, of course, we got Washington, which is a whole new situation. Yeah, I mean, new ownership too. I mean, that goes from the top down. That's not just a coach. Everything is new in Washington. New front office. Adam Peters is the GM. And how soon? Are they going to force feed Jaden Daniels into the lineup? Who did they sign to to start over before Jaden Daniels? I don't even remember now. I know they brought someone in, but I mean, here's the thing: they drafted him number two overall. There's going to be so much pressure. Oh, and Mariota, right, Marcus Mariota. There's going to be so much pressure unless Mariota wins the job in camp and goes like three and zero out of the box. People are going to be banging down the doors to start the kid from the get-go. That's the way it is in this league. The fans have no patience. They want these rookie quarterbacks to start right away, especially if you're picked high. Yeah. He's going to get force-fed. Chances are. You're probably right. And it will go poorly because it usually <laughs> does. It, it usually does. Except C- Not everybody is C.J. Stroud and Andrew Locke. I was just about to Andrew Locke, bring up I should say. Well, those are the two guys who buck the system. Yeah. Peyton Manning. Troy Aikman, you weren't around for those guys. Okay, when those two guys started as rookies, man, a skunk smelled pretty. That's how bad they were. Okay, that's what happens. But just about, you know, what the caller Marty just brought up about how he thinks it's going to come down to the end of the season and basically who can outcoach the other one, Mm -hmm. I will say I feel pretty confident in – Brian Dable's ability to coach, especially late in the season. Yep. I mean, we we all know what happened in his first season, as you mentioned, coach of the year. They clinched the you know the playoff spot. They won a playoff game. But I want to even talk about last year, which obviously a lot of things did not go right for the Giants. And there was a point probably around midway through the season where they could have just mailed it in. They could have said, you know, this season's not going our way. They scrapped. We're just going to like – you know, 
not, basically just punt on the rest of the season and they get scrapped. to the offseason. They scrapped. But they did not do that. Brian Dable and the rest of the coaching staff did not let the team do that. They put together a three-game winning streak with an undrafted rookie quarterback, Tommy mm-hmm. DeVito, mm-hmm. which at least for a little bit brought them right back into the thick of the wild card race in the NFC. And Belt of the obviously, Eagles. yeah, obviously, while that. while you know <laughs> the Giants ended up going six and eleven, which obviously the, everyone across the board would like that record to have been better. They showed up week eighteen to play against the Philadelphia Eagles team that still had a chance to win the NFC East. And they destroyed them. The Eagles have had, you know, the Giants number in recent years. But in that Week 18 matchup, I mean, Jalen Hurts was pulled in the second quarter because the game was so lopsided already that the Eagles were just throwing up the white flag, saying, we'll take the wild card spot. You know, Giants, this game is yours. Almost all the Eagles starters played the first half. Yeah. Almost all of them. And the Giants got up to... they were being hammered yeah i think it was a three touchdown lead and in the that, first half and at that point it was like we we gotta we lick our wounds and go home let's get out of here the giants are just manhandling us yeah so i bring that up because that was the last game of the season a game that meant literally nothing for the giants except for personal pride and they went out there and they fought from the very first whistle they flattened until them. the end and they destroyed uh, the our biggest division rival and our first time beating the eagles in a couple years in the regular season I mean, that was good to see so they Brian Dable has shown that he can get his team to fight. The, the players in the locker room are going to continue to fight for him until the season is completely over. They're not going to ever give up. So if it comes down to who can outcoach who at the end of the season, I like my chances with Brian Dable at well, the there's a, there's a lot of team involved in that Giants locker room. Guys legitimately like each other, and they play for each other, not just for the coach. They play for each other. It was a really good group of guys last year, which is one of the reasons why it hurts so much to see them finish with only six wins because those players deserve more rewards for what they put in, and it just did not happen for them. All right, quickly want to get to these spots, then the phone calls because you guys are really lighting up the phones. Uh, the Giants Huddle Podcast has long-form interviews with staff, past, present, players, coaches, NFL dignitaries, don't forget, you can subscribe uh, on your favorite podcast platform or go to Giants.com slash podcasts. Leave a positive review on Apple Podcast If you can, let us know the program is worth listening to. And don't forget to take your season membership to the next level. Be connected to the club all year long, not just on game days. Memberships are now available for the 2024 season. To learn more or all about the exclusive member benefits, visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is available. And then finally, the Giants TV app has all kinds of original video content, game highlights on demand, great stuff. It's all for you, the Big Blue fan, at Giants TV. Uh, It's free on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and the Giants mobile app. That takes care of the spots, and we go right back to the phones. RJ is on line two from Georgia. You're next on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. Hey, what's up, fellas? How you doing? Good to hey, talk RJ. to you. Good, good. Hey, listen, um, I'm just excited about the uh, upcoming season. I know it's a big year for uh, uh, Joe Shung, Shane, and Dable, uh, but I'm just optimistic that, you know, we are going to do some good things. I don't want to make any predictions because I'm not trying to jinx us, but I just feel good about where, they, where they're where at, what they did, because it, it appears that they covered all the areas of need for the upcoming season, and I can't tell you how excited I am about the upcoming season. Well, I appreciate the sentiments. I will say this to you, though. Uh, Going into training camp last year, it looked as though that that returning playoff team had covered all of its needs for the 2023 campaign as well. And then what happened? Guys started dropping like flies. And before you know it, all those needs that you thought you covered – They became holes again. So I appreciate the thought. I think you're right that the primary needs have been covered. We mentioned some thin spots, but the primary needs have been covered. The plan looks good. But again, Lady Luck's going to come in, and she may bless the team, or she may kick the team in the butt. And and you know what? And not to cut you off, Paul, but I'm I'm one of those guys that we talk every year about as we we approach – you know, all the camps, uh, OTAs and all that. I try to keep my eyes off the bottom of the screen on ESPN 
for injuries, and I hope and pray that yeah. we're one of the teams that stay away from those those injuries that's going to really, you know, turn our season around the uh, the negative way. Tell me about it. I will say though, to to RJ's point about the moves that were made this off season, obviously you can't plan on injuries. Injuries are going to happen every single year. However, this was the first off season, and Joe Shane has been open about this, where the front office really had a, a good chunk of money to go out and spend it how they saw saw fit. You know, the cap space, the cap situation wasn't the greatest when they first when Joe Shane first got here. Got a little bit better last year, but this was the first year where they really got to make an imprint on the roster by bringing guys in. And there's one one common theme about almost every single player between free agency and the draft that they brought in. Durability. Durability. They brought in guys that either don't get hurt or play through injuries. I mean, Tyler Newbin played through okay. a torn meniscus last year. Played six <sighs> games through a torn meniscus. Malik Neighbors, I think, has missed hasn't missed a game the last two years. Stop, stop. No, look, these this are just is where I need to remind you that Olivier <laughs> Vernon was never hurt till he got to the Giants. I know. Leonard Williams was I get never it. hurt until I he get came it. to Big Blue. But look, you can't plan I on you it. can't plan on injuries. All Jinx, you can do Jinx, what are you doing? What all I'm saying <laughs> is you'd like the common theme of all the players that they brought in. They brought in guys, you know, we've since they've day one, since they've been here, Joe Shane and Brian Dable, it's been smart, tough, dependable. And they brought in guys that fit those last two correct words, especially this offseason, with across all of their moves. Paul, it's only May. You can't be worried about jinxes this early. <laughs> I have one more thing if I may add. Please, RJ, go ahead. Yes, and then I'll, I'll take it off the air. Uh, I want to Kalani strangle this guy. <laughs> no whammies on this team, please. <laughs> it's uh, Darren, Darren Waller. Yes. You know, I know he's going through something personal in his life, but I'm, I'm hoping and praying that that gets uh, cleared up of and course. that he returns because he is a big part of what we uh, are going to do this year. And I'll, I'll take that off the air and uh, thank you guys for all, with, all that you do. Thank you, RJ. Appreciate the call. 201-939-4513. A line is now open quickly. I think we've already discussed it, but again, for those of you who may have missed some shows this week, Theo Johnson out of Penn State, fourth-round draft pick, uh, second most athletic tight end in the draft next to Brock Bowers, okay? Uh, six six or so, 260 pounds. He is a two-way tight end. He will block. He will get downfield and make catches. He will get some yak yardage. He was involved in a very subpar Penn State offensive attack, specifically their passing game. I really strongly believe he's going to be a much better, more productive pro than he was in college. I could not agree more. I mean, the tight end position, especially going into the draft, is one where you can't really just look at what they did in college because every single program asks – so many different responsibilities out of their tight ends that it's not it's unlike any other position really with the transition from college to the nfl so what you want to bet on when you're drafting a player at that position is basically their athleticism and as you brought up theo johnson is incredibly athletic not only was he the second you know most athletic tight end at the combine this year but his ras score or a ras score mm -hmm. was ninth out of almost 1,200 tight ends since 1987. Relative athletic score. It's Nine. a measurement based on all the different drills. Yeah, based on all the different drills. He ranked ninth out of 1,199 tight ends since 1987. And the thing about it, him about him is that because he has length and height and he's got the frame to out-muscle, let's say, a linebacker or a strong safety for a ball, he should be a much easier target in the passing game than a Daniel Bellinger will. Daniel Bellinger, I still think, is is got a lot of ups. I think he had a down year last year. Okay, honestly, I, I thought I thought he was better as a rookie, or even though he got hurt. I thought last year he was a little bit down. Uh, I'm hoping for a bounce back season for him, but I think the the ceiling or the upside because of Theo Johnson's physical skills, characteristics, and tools is probably higher. Yeah, no, I, I'm on the same page as you. I just think, and you know, as the caller mentioned, I we all I think we all agree we would love to see Darren Waller back this season, without a doubt. Without a doubt, I mean, he is would be the best pass catching option the Giants have at the tight end position 
in terms of him, Bellinger, and Theo Johnson. And I think it would just behoove Theo Johnson if he's given a little bit of time to develop and yeah. learn the position in the NFL instead of just kind of getting thrown into the fire. Even if, let's say, Darren Waller does retire, I do think at least to start the year, Daniel Bellinger will, I would think, would be the starting tight end. Probably. And Theo Johnson will compete with some of the other guys, you know, Lawrence Cager. Uh, well, like Lawrence Cager is really the, yeah, the that type of tight blockers. end. The other yeah. guys are blockers. They'll and compete. Bellinger might hold the job all season. If he, could. he bounces yeah. back and has a really, really good year, he'll hold it. I agree with you that Bellinger showed a lot of promise in his rookie good year. player. And last year, obviously, the Giants brought in Darren Waller, who took over the starting tight end spot. So Bellinger was asked to do less. Was and he asked couldn't to block a lot more. Yeah, too. it was asked to block more, run less routes. Uh, and even when Darren Waller got hurt, I believe Lawrence Cager was really mm -hmm. got more, you know, routes out there than than Bellinger did. So overall, would love to see Waller back. But yeah, I am very encouraged by Theo Johnson. I think especially if he can just get like a year to learn the position, he can grow and become develop into a very good tight end in the NFL. All right, back to the phones. Jeff in Maine, you're on line three on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. Afternoon, gentlemen. Hi. Uh, hey. Great great draft coverage, as usual. Uh, real excited about the draft. I love the neighbor's pick. I'm a big uh, uh, Joe Shane fan. I have, uh, I've loved every move he's made since he's been there. And uh, there was one uh, 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 free agent signing a few weeks ago that I'm wondering is kind of under the radar. Okay. And um, – and it's about Jordan Phillips. You yep. know, to me, I think he maybe he might be the, the the fourth starter we've been looking for. He's got he's got over sixty starts. Uh, he had nine and a half sacks back in like 2019. He seems like he'd be perfect for what the new uh, D coordinator is looking for. And as far as stopping the run, I I think that uh, the way that they'll stop the run is by a having a better defense overall. But um, you know, he's got the four guys, and he could bring up people in support. You know, if needed. Um, but I mean, am I missing something, or how is how is he not perfect to be like the the fourth starter that we've been looking for? Well, he's a little bit older. He's got more experience. He's got a track record, obviously. But I think, to be frank, he's probably been a little more inconsistent in his career than he would like to have been. And if you're the Giants, you're looking at him and you're saying, okay, we brought him in. We got guys from Buffalo who know of him from his time with the Bills, so you're familiar with him. You like that. And you're wondering how much gas he's got left in his tank. I think to bring him in and just say, okay, he's going to be the other defensive tackle next to Dexter Lawrence, I think that's a mistake. I think he's in here to compete. I think they're going to have Nacho compete with him, Riley compete with him, Davidson compete with him. I think they're going to say, Dexter, you got one DT spot, and the other one is going to be a battle. Let's make it a tug of war. Let's see who deserves to be the lead dog. Why wouldn't you do that? Yeah, I, I think the reason why the Phillips signing kind of went a little under the radar and, you know, he signed for the reported number that he signed for was as low as it was, was because he's really just he's been derailed by injuries the last couple of years. I mean, you brought up the season a couple of years ago where he had nine and a half sacks. That was the last time he played a full season. Since, you know, starting in 2020, he's played nine games, nine games, 12 games, and 14 games. So he's gotten a little bit healthier the last two years. But that's really been the biggest thing that's been holding him back. If he can stay healthy, then I fully agree that I think, you know, it might take him a couple weeks into the season. But eventually, I think he will take over as the starting defensive tackle spot next to Dexter Lawrence. But he's got to stay healthy. That's, I mean, that's a, obviously, across the board, that's the biggest thing with all these players. But... With Phillips in particular, injuries have derailed the last couple of years. But I do agree. As of right now, I think Phillips was brought in to compete with Nacho and those two young guys, and even Ryder Anderson, to compete for that spot next to Dexter Lawrence. But I agree. Phillips brings a you know pass-rushing ability that I would say is probably better than the other guys that he'd be competing with for that second defensive tackle spot next to Dexter Lawrence. Ultimately... I think if Jordan Riley, last year's seventh-round pick, really climbs the ladder and climbs the stairs and shows dramatic improvement, it would be foolish if he if he can win the job not to give it to him. Oh, of course. But and and the question becomes, does he have enough ups to do it? I thought his flashes were pretty pretty good last year. I couldn't agree more. I don't want to I don't want to to deny him the opportunity because. 
I think he does have enough ups that he could steal that job. I agree, but he just has to show it. Got to show it. Phillips is, show has, it. is a lot more proven at this point no through doubt. their respective careers, no of course. But And I bet, mentioned this yesterday. The reason why I'm encouraged by, not obviously with Dexter Lawrence, but the other guys in the group, more importantly than anything, is the coach that's coaching them at their position, Andre Patterson, mm -hmm. is just – I mean, I'll continue to say it anytime we talk about the defensive line, he's probably the best, if not one of the best defensive line coaches in the NFL. And I think he could be a big factor in, you know, Jordan Riley, D DJ Davidson taking that next step in their development and becoming more solidified, like starting caliber players. And if you listen to the show yesterday, I mentioned, I think Ryder Anderson and Boogie Basham could potentially be three technique options, certainly in a sub package. I wouldn't be shocked if I saw that in training camp. Okay, well, I don't disagree with anything you're, you're saying. I, the only injury I read about with Jordan Phillips was like a, a minor wrist thing. I don't know. But also, I, I thought I read that they're paying them like $5 million a year. So I'm, I'm not 100% sure about that. But to me, that seems like kind of an investment. Thing. I'm going to look at the, uh, the contract that was reported for him right now. Uh, no. No, that would not be the case. The reported contract, okay. according to Over the Cap, was was under two million. I think you're. Oh, okay. I think okay. you're looking at the deal he signed with Buffalo a year or two ago. Uh, okay, yeah, must be, must be. So okay, we will well, see. Thanks. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Well, thanks, gentlemen. Appreciate it. All Thank right, you. have a great day. Two zero one nine three nine four five one three. Dan Salomon's producing our program today. Who's up next, Dan? Are we going to line one or line two? We're going to line one. Joe from South Plainfield. You're next on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. Hey, how are you guys doing? Thank you so much for taking my call. Thank you for coming, Good. Joe. What's up, Joe? First of all, Paul, I absolutely love your passion for this team. I know you work for them, but you're a diehard fan through and through, and that shows every day. And as a diehard <laughs> fan myself, I greatly appreciate it. So thank you. That's awfully kind. I appreciate the thoughts. So one thing that this regime is trying to do that previous regimes haven't been able to accomplish and the younger fan might not understand is that they're trying to develop their players. Over the last three off-seasons now, this is their third draft, they've, all, they've spent significant draft capital on corner. they spent draft capital on defensive tackle. The Ryder Andersons, like you were talking about yesterday. And if Dre Patterson can uh, develop them into something really, you know, uh, star-studded players, then there you have your answer. That's why I don't think they really went too heavy in those uh, positions within the draft because they know what they have. And I'm sorry, Nick McLeod, I think he's going to be a star. I'm biased towards Notre Dame. However, I think he'll be good opposite Tate Banks, especially what we were talking about earlier uh, with Jordan Rondon. Well, you know, the benefit of, of any one of those guys who are flying under the radar right now, besides them being in-house, is that they're not very expensive. Those guys all on the back end of the depth chart right now aren't going to break the bank. And so if they step up and win a major role on the team, you've got an economic benefit. 100%. Definitely. And one other thing, if I can, uh, what you were talking about before, I just hope fans don't discount that win against the Eagles in Week 18. Like you said, they were playing for everything. We could have just packed it up and went home, and you saw what they did to them. So you want to talk about closing the gap, especially after this draft, you know, as long as Daniel Jones can stay healthy and play well, I think we can compete for the division. I think, the, e I think the Eagles were very unhappy with the way that game went and then obviously their postseason exit because you saw this year, what did they do first thing? They went two defensive backs immediately in their first two picks of the draft. That secondary looked old, slow, and beaten up. And it was obvious uh, the defense needed some retooling. And, and they went to work on the defense in the draft. So they, they know the score. They, they know what's going on. Yep. It's going to be an interesting year for sure. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, guys, for taking my call. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. 201-939-4513. You've got a couple of lines open. Now we go to James in Georgia. You're next on the program. Hello. James, what do you got for us today? Hey, I'm sorry, guys. Um, no, it's all good. <clears throat> Actually, I just walked into the dog room. That's um, okay. You, uh, just just, just make sure they're not going after the mailman, okay? That's right. <laughs> so I'm here with Barkley now, you know. And there you I, go. I'm dark Barkley right before he leaves the team. But uh, we'll talk about that another day. I've gotten about it before. Um, have y'all talked about the cornerbacks that they, that they purported just brought in already earlier in the show? I yeah. I kind of missed the opening. 
Yeah, okay. we we opened well, with the signing of David Long. Okay, well, I'll go back and look at um, well, you can give him, we'll, we'll give you a quick thumbnail. That's all right. Hold on a second. Give, give him a quick recap again. Former L.A. Ram. He's been yep. in the league for five years. Yep. Started his career with the Rams. Was a third-round pick. Played with Los Angeles for four years. Won a Super Bowl. Then bounced around last year between Raiders, Panthers, Packers. Saw you know limited action with each of those teams. Uh, but, yeah, solid outside corner. Has been played solid in the limited action he's got in. Uh, Part-time starter out of the University of Michigan. Former Michigan. Yep. Okay. Oh yeah, because my um my question was kind of, it, I think I called the um the other day like what kind of a body type specifically. Five eleven one ninety something we said right. Five eleven one ninety six is what NFL.com oh. has him listed as. Okay, okay. So um, is that like one of the, I like the depth on our team, but do you think that's like the one of the last pieces? that you would say we're missing just to round out um, as far as that that cornerback? And is there any, um, do you think that we have the cap space to bring in, say, a trade for a number one wide receiver so we have two big men at the wide receiver position and neighbors, the rookie, and a guy maybe we can rent for two years? Who's, you know, yeah. looking to get out of his I, I think you're being so very ambitious. Yeah, you're being know, you're being very ambitious. I I don't see the Giants having enough of spare change right now to go out and right. buy an expensive player, nor do I see them in position to make a deal for someone with a big contract. They already did that with Brian Burns, and that that yeah. was their big splash move. Right, right, right. Well, yeah, that's like I said. I like the depth on the, on the team right now, so I'll just see if there's anything that you saw putting your DM hats on that we could possibly do to round out the roster. I'm going to get this guy groomed up here, and uh, I'll see you guys later. See <laughs> okay. Thanks very much for the call. 201-939-4513. See, we, we provide a public service, right? <laughs> we're, we're keeping him occupied while he grooms his dog. Yeah. That's, you know, it's very useful. Yeah. But we did, you know, to the caller's point, we did touch on yesterday a couple of areas that we thought that the front office could still look to address. And sure enough, cornerback was one of them. And a couple hours later, news came out that we signed David Long. Yep. Uh, I know we touched on this earlier. I would think that after that signing that I don't think they're going to add another cornerback, at least at this time being. Maybe closer to the season, once training camp gets underway, maybe they add another body then. But I think as things stand right now, that the cornerback group that they currently have probably is what they will go into the into training camp with likely i mean you never know and even to your point about you know probably not pulling off a big trade i agree with you probably they will not but joe shane has shown that he is not afraid to pull the trigger on a trade if he sees a, a player that he deems to be talented available on the trade market i wouldn't be totally shocked if at some point over the next couple of months if joe shane is able to swing a trade for you know, I'm not going to throw out any, any positions, but whoever it is, a, a you know, a good starting caliber player that is maybe nearing the end of their current contract. And then the Giants could, tr similar to what they just did with Brian Burns, trade for the player and then sign to a long-term extension. It's sort of, you know, obviously if they did that, it would probably cost them some form of draft capital, but it is sort of a way to just get a slightly head start on free agency, next year's free agency when you trade for a player and sign him to a big extension. So just based on of some of the moves that Joe Shane has made these last couple of years, I can't say I would be surprised if he's ends up pulling some sort of move like that. And a move that, you know, sort of unexpected. I mean, prior to the Brian Burns trade, like the rumors of it happening, like the couple hours before it actually did happen, there was no word about that happening at all. It sort of just came out of the blue. All of a sudden, Giants and Panthers are deep in talks for Brian Burns. Well, the rumors are only about fantasies and, and non-truths. That's why. That's why they're rumors. It's true. Okay? That's why they're rumors. They're rumors to gain interest in stories, clickbait, if you will. And that's why they are rumors. Yeah. Something that's true. My God, you don't think that's actually going to get out there, do you? <laughs> Man. I mean, as we've seen during the lead-up to the draft, <laughs> Joe Shane and the whole front office does a very good job at keeping their true intentions under wraps. 
I they mean, still have people guessing what they were doing in the first round. You're right. There have been They're six all... different scenarios that have been presented by some of the media over the course of the last week. Six different scenarios. Yeah, I know. We were talking about it after the show yesterday yeah. off the air. But yeah, even since the draft ended, there are numerous reports. Oh, the Giants tried to do this to get this player or wanted to do this to get that player. Still, no one actually knows, you know, I guess what going into the draft, the absolute dream Short scenario would have been. Short of being in the room. Short, Short of being, of being in the room, room. Nobody else knows. But I can tell you, everyone in the building is very happy that Malik Neighbors is now a new giant. True. That is without a doubt. Uh, 201-939-4513. We've got about 15 minutes left on the program. The lines are open. If you want to be a first-time caller, this is a great time to get in. In fact, I just saw someone buzz a, buzz a line right now, so we'll get to you in a second. I will add this. I love what you said about Joe Shane doing the unexpected because he pulled two trades late in the summer last year out of his hat that nobody had any inclination on, and they were minor deals when he made the trade to get Boogie Basham from the Bills and Isaiah Simmons from the Cardinals. There was nothing in the trade wins about those deals, and he went and grabbed both of those guys in relatively small trade packages, obviously, I think if you're going to see something this summer, it'll be along those lines. It'll be one of those kinds of deals. I don't think you're going to see a blockbuster. No, I, I tend to agree with you. That's I, All I said was you never know just because Joe Shane has shown he is not afraid he is to not trade. Afraid. Whether not it's afraid. acquiring a player, trading away a player for draft picks, he is not afraid or hesitant at all to pull the trigger on a deal. This but I do, I do agree that chances are if some sort of deal does happen – it probably will be similar to, you know, Isaiah Simmons for a seventh round pick or Boogie Basham for, what was it, a swap of picks? They I swapped believe. a six and a six and a five or in six next, and a seven. In next year's I draft? I think so, yeah. Yeah. So chances are it would be something like that, but you just, you never know. You never know. All right, 201 939 4513. I told you the lines are starting to light up, and indeed, Ken from Sparta is next on the program. Hello. Hey, how you doing, Paul? Oh, uh, well, Ken, how are you? Pretty good. Looking forward to the season. A uh, couple things I was ready to talk about. Offensive line. Yep. Okay, I think it has improved tremendously. One, with the coach. Two, I really think Neil is going to be moved in the guard, and Illuminor will be our uh, right tackle. All right. Okay. I'll let you talk about that after I'm off. Okay. The second thing is the defensive coach. All right. I think that the linebacker and edge coach is going to make a big difference. And that's why Wink got fired or left because his friends got fired. They never really coached those guys up. And I think Tomon Fox is a really a diamond in the rough. Well, let, let me just answer that one while we have you on the line. Tamont Fox right. showed some flashes two years ago, and he is still here, and that's a good thing because I do think the man's got some ability and some talent. So I'm glad he's coming to training camp with a chance to win a job on the 53. But I would also say this. While Aziz Ojolari had a rough time last year and did battle some hurts once again, um, Kayvon Thibodeau clearly picked his game up to another level. So oh, I think, I'm not, and, I'm and not to be frank, well, no, but here's the point: you did say you thought that the the edge rushing coaching wasn't up to speed. Well, Thibodeau, you know, became a legitimate bona fide stud uh, in his second year. And the Giants continued to get some production out of Jihad Ward, who has been a journeyman in his career and actually gave the Giants two pretty solid seasons for what he was asked to do. Yep. So, you know, to just dismiss the edge-rushing coaching of last year, we give them a backhanded dismissal, I don't know that that's fair. That's fair, I, but I, 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 do, not, I do just want to touch, t- touch on who was brought in because I feel like this coach has barely been discussed since he arrived, but the Giants went out and signed, uh, got a new outside linebackers mm-hmm. coach, Charlie Bullen, right. who was with Illinois last year, but prior to that spent three seasons with the Arizona Cardinals 
in those three seasons, starting 2020, Hassan Reddick was the team leader with 12 and a half sacks. The following year, granted, it's a little easier when you have J.J. Watt. But <laughs> or that, well, actually, J.J. Watt, J.J. Watt actually only had one sack that year because he was injured. 2021 season, Marcus Golden, former New York right. Giant, 11 sacks. Chandler Jones, 10 and a half sacks. Mm-hmm. And then 2022 is when J.J. Watt led the Cardinals with 12 and a half sacks. So Charlie Bullen has gotten a lot of production out of his edge rushers. Well, Watt, Watt was more of a uh, – he was – versatile he was moving all over true and again that's also you know first ballot yes. hall of famer but, yes indeed but the two years prior to that with slightly lesser named guys he got a lot of production double digit sacks three double digit sacks seasons between, or between the two seasons three players double digit sacks i think to that- to to his point about the coaching and to your point ken i'm gonna let you talk in just a second carmen brasillo the new offensive line coach is also a guy who has had a track record of bringing out the best in what was otherwise not expected to be a very productive offensive line when he was with the Raiders. Right. These are what I'm talking about. All right. Uh, The young guys that we have had, you know, I'm not knocking the coaches, but they haven't been coached up. Thibodeau was going to be good. All right. Thibodeau works at it. Okay. But we need somebody that can coach up players well let's hope that these guys are able to do it i mean we've said this on this program ever since big blue kickoff live started at least i have because i've been around such a long time and i know the value of stats okay the assistants are incredibly important to the success of a football team on a year-to-year basis Everybody points to the head coach all the time. He's the magnet like the quarterback is on the field. The head coach is the magnet on the sideline. But the fact remains, okay, Coughlin and Parcells, you know, two of the most successful coaches in Giants history. We won't go back to the olden days. But these guys had really terrific staffs. The staff is a big deal. It's a very big deal. Uh, Yes, yes. Heck, yes. how about the 2000 team that went to the Super Bowl and lost to the Ravens? All right, look at John Fox, Sean Payton. You think you think yes. Fossil, you think Jim Fossil wasn't happy to have those guys? That's it. I agree. Anyway. That, that's why, the, uh, you know, uh, basically, Steve Spagnuolo. All right. Loves bags. Yes. Yes. All right. What else you got? Nope, that's about it. That's all, right, all Ken. I needed to go over. Thanks for calling. Right. We appreciate it. Thank you, Ken. Talk to you later. 201-939-4513. Oh, we got about eight minutes or so left in the show. Actually, no, it's only about five minutes. We got to cut off a few minutes early today. Yep. They need the uh, studio. Excuse me. Joseph and Glens Falls, you're next on the show. Hello. How are you guys doing? Well, sir, good. how are you? How are you? Good, good, good. Thank you. I want to change the subject a little bit here. You go back to the last three or four games Yep. last year, and one thing I thought that was distinctly different the way the Giants' offense was playing is Barkley was pulling himself out of the game, and I love Barkley. He was a great running back. I, he was good. I, we're going to miss him, and mm-hmm. we replaced him with a lot, of, a lot of people. But what I noticed is the ball distribution changed. It, when when Barkley was in, it was a quick answer for the back for the quarterback. Mm-hmm. And if you watch, if you go back and look at those games, all of a sudden Slayton was in the game, uh, Jalen Hyatt was in the game, Wondell Robinson was in the game, and they were all producing. Well, to your and point, Barkley was on the sideline. Yeah, to your point, uh, after the bye week. The Giants had five games, and I'm going to quote the numbers right off the machine because it may be easy for people to forget. They scored 24 against Green Bay, 6 against New Orleans, 25 against Philly, 25 against the Rams, and 27 against Philadelphia. Okay? Now, that's more along the lines of the point production that this team's going to need this year if they're going to be in any kind of race at all. Those are four, four of those five games are against playoff teams, too. Yeah. It's going to be about distribution. It it was just too obvious. Everything was going to Barkley, whether it was a check down, whether whether it was a run, mm-hmm. it, didn't, it didn't matter. 
And, and I think that dynamic change may actually be the catalyst for the offense to do much better. Well, I think you had a lot of things at work there. Uh, obviously, toward the end of the season is one issue. Uh, how, how many people are at that point broken down, worn down? You had the, the Giants basically introducing, no, no one had seen really Tyrod Taylor play in a while. S- certainly nobody knew about Tommy DeVito. Okay, so yeah. there was an element of surprise there to some degree. Um, you had some of the offensive linemen who had now gotten a little bit more r- familiar with what they were trying to do because it was the end of the season when as earlier in the year it was really rough. Now they were finding some sense of continuity, some sense of understanding as to what they were going to do. So I get it. You know, there were there were some small factors, but the biggest factor of all was that the guys continued to play for each other and for the coaching staff. Yeah. That was the biggest factor. 100%. Yeah, yeah. You said that earlier in the show. Now, uh, add Malik Neighbors to this. Yeah. Right? I, 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 and and um, add Tyrone, uh, what's his name? Um, the, the, the Tyrone pitch, um, Tracy. Right. Yeah, Tyrone Tracy. And add Daniel Jones uh, to the uh, equation, uh, uh, too. Okay, let me do that. Let me add Daniel Jones to the equation, too. And then add Daniel Jones to that. There, there's a lot of weapons there. And, and there's, there's a lot of weapons that need to be covered. So oh. I, I, I'm optimistic that if they can distribute the ball and they can not show their hand on these offensive plays, I, I think they're going to do fine. Well, thanks for the call. Appreciate it very much, Joseph. I think Wondell Robinson also, as he started to gain his strength back in that uh, surgically repaired leg, second half of the season, he started to show a lot more of what they wanted when they drafted him two years ago. Yeah, he started to show exactly what he was showing right prior to the the torn ACL suffered two years ago. Uh, But I'm very glad that the caller just brought up Tyrone Tracy because I love getting a chance to talk about this kid anytime I do. But We've I've, we've spoke or I spoke with uh, John early in the week about how Tyrone Tracy just testing wise, the numbers were very very similar to what Debo Samuel's numbers looked like coming out of college, and while Debo Samuel is a natural wide receiver who will sometimes get you know carries out of the backfield, I really believe that under the guidance and coaching of Joel Thomas, Tyrone Tracy could in time develop into a running back that they will sometimes put out wide on third down and passing situations. And have him run routes, and have him have a great mismatches with a line, a middle linebacker trying to defend this speedy big running back lined up out wide. And I think that's going to cause a lot of mismatches for the offense, and that's one player that I just really cannot wait to see him get out on the field. One and see of what many he can do. things we'll be keeping an eye on during training camp. That'll do it for today's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live. It's part of the Giants platforms, podcast platforms everywhere and at Giants.com slash podcast. You can find the archive right there. It is always presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Giants. 